is the best modality for the diagnosis of osteoporosis at present. However, there are many hows, whens, and whys regarding timing, utility, and limitations of this modality. To take us through this topic, we have a very eminent endocrinologist, Dr. Nisha Nijal Haroon. She is an assistant professor in endocrinology from Northern Ontario School of Medicine. Osteoporosis is her core research area, and she has received clinical fellowship in osteoporosis program at UHN Toronto. She has received MSc Clinical Epidemiology from Clinical University Toronto, as well as many awards, including Young Investigator Award from Endocrinology Society of USA, World Congress of Osteoporosis ESCO, Ellie Lilly Scholarship. She is President of the Association of Medical Graduates of Kerala Origin, and as well as a member of member board of many international journals. We are privileged to have you as our faculty. Over you to Madam. Yeah, Thank so you, Vishad, and uh, Dr. Vishad, Dr. Veena, and the entire team of uh, IRIS. Am I audible? Yeah, audible. Uh, okay. Second, can you enable the uh, screen sharing? So it is done. You can okay. share now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So my objectives, uh, these are my disclosures. I think I'm on my disclosure slide. Uh, just a moment. Yeah, I'm waiting for your screen uh, to be visible. Uh, second, I'm, I'm not able to go to the screen share option. Can you just uh, enable me for the screen share option? Uh, sir, it is on only. I think you need to rejoin again. Okay. Am I out of it? Yeah. Yeah, just give me a moment. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah, you are audible, uh, but you are not to be seen. Uh, yes, I'm from the technical department. Any issue? Okay. okay. Jay? Okay. 
Vishal sir was not able to share his screen. Vishal sir? I think so, sir. Yeah, I think sir has started sharing. Hello. Yeah, Dr. Nisha, we can start with your talk. It's raining here, so the connection got disturbed here. Okay, okay. So, yeah, I'll proceed. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm going, I'm moving to the um, disclosure slide. Uh, so, I'm a member of the Scientific Advisory C Council of Osteoporosis Canada, and I've had speaker commitments with Amgen, Ella, Lili, Novo Nordisk, Castro, and Janssen. Um, so, uh, I hope to give an overview of bone density and bone strength as a predictor of fracture risk. We'll briefly look at the different uh, techniques and technical limitations of DEXA. That's the uh, main uh, goal for today's talk. So, on my next slide, uh, I'm going to um, start with the definition of osteoporosis. We all know we go by the WHO diagnostic classification, and it's based on T-score, neg less than negative 2.5, at the hip or lumbar spine. And we also know that the risk of fracture is highest in those with the lowest BMD. But the, but the other important thing uh, that we need to be uh, aware of is that the majority of fractures potentially occur in patients with low bone mass rather than osteoporosis. So, and major osteoporotic fractures occur at the lumbar spine, uh, thoracolumbar spine, uh, to be precise, the lower aspect of the thoracic spine and the lumbar uh, area and the hip and also the wrist. And one common uh, clinical encounter that we often come across is we often get referrals for fractures of the scalp or face or fingers and toes. And these are not osteoporotic fractures by classic definitions. And osteoporosis, by all means, is actually the most common bone disease in humans. And by the standard definition, it is characterized by low bone mass, deterioration of bone tissue, disruption of bone architecture. So those are the new, newer aspects that we know more now. And there is compromised bone strength, consequently resulting in increased fracture risk. So coming to fracture risk, with each standard deviation drop in mean bone density, we can expect to see 1.5 to threefold rise in fracture risk. Actually, for each 10% decrease in uh, bone density, the, area, you know? the fracture risk approximately doubles. Uh, Nisha, can you hold on for a moment? Because the, the screen is not getting shared. There is some technical problem. Just give me a okay. couple of minutes. Is the screen visible, Gayatri? Okay. Uh, no, sir. Can you start again, sir? Is it all visible now? No, it's not. Okay. Um, shall I do one thing? Uh, I think uh, probably there is a problem with my internet. Um, Why don't you stop sharing? Is it's showing Vishavishnath has started screen sharing? Okay, is it coming? No, no, no. It's nothing is coming, but it is written there. So from your computer, is it showing that your screen is being shared? In that case, you stop that sharing. Yeah, I just stopped the screen sharing. And That's now right. Then now only, uh, now only Dr. Nisha can uh, share the slides. No, actually, I am sharing the slides of Dr. Nisha. Okay, fine. It is, it is uh, but I cannot see any slides. It just yeah. shows a massive message. Uh, Gayatri, uh, have you uh, inactivated a screen sharing option for me? Yes, sir. Have you enabled only Dr. Nisha to share the screen here now? No, no. Dr. Nisha is not uh, sharing the screen. Uh, she has given me the presentation, so I will be sharing the screen. Yes, sir. You can start, sir. 
I can start now. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Is it uh, is it okay now? No, not yet. yet. Not yet. Uh, it is like uh, due to this network is very low at your place. That is why your screen okay. is not visible to us. Okay, the network is low. That is why. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I do one thing? Uh, can I uh, send over this presentation to? Uh, we'll just uh, take a break and uh, we'll rejoin in five minutes. I'll send out this presentation uh, uh, to you to the administrator side, and we can uh, restart from there. Sure. Okay. Right. Uh, Dr. Nisha, can you just uh, uh, can wait? can we um, go ahead without the slides? Is that okay? Uh, no. I, I, if you can oh, just better, uh, yeah. wait for five minutes, please wait for five minutes. Yeah. Shall I share my screen? See if that's, that will work. Nisha, do you have a presentation on your laptop? Yeah, but I'm using my mobile phone. That's the problem. Uh, then that may not be possible. I'll just, uh, just hold on a moment.
Is it visible slides? Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's visible. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, Rapnisha, shall I start? Shall we start? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, uh, okay. can we move on to the next slide? Uh, okay. Disclosure. Uh, you can. Uh, I, I. I was on slide seven. Thank you. One second. It's not moving actually. Uh, uh, can you just download the presentation? Yes. If possible. Yeah. So. Yeah. One second. Yeah. Okay. I will save it. Actually. Yeah. Right yeah. Play you have just open. It. Yes. Veena. Somebody else is sharing it? No, no. Uh, Veena, please go ahead. But it is showing. You cannot share because someone else is sharing the slides. I think, uh, uh, Gayatri, are you sharing it? No? No, no, no. Uh, Ma'am, can you start now? Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry. fine. Yeah. Just make it full screen, Ma'am, please. Yeah. Veena, go to slideshow. Okay. Yes. Veena, can okay. we go to slide seven? Yeah. Sorry for the delay. This is it. This one. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So I, I was talking about how uh, fracture risk is connected to bone density. So we do know that uh, the uh, e with each ten percent drop in BMD, the fracture risk approximately doubles. But there's one important reminder here: the relationship is usually not uh, linear. And coming to the most important aspect of bone fragility, it's actually predicted by bone strength. And we do know that apart from bone mass density, which is measured by DEXA, we have other parameters that determine fragility. And that this include bone architecture, bone mineralometric properties, and bone turnover, which is uh, in yeah. indeed a reflection of bone resorption and bone Sorry, formation. So, Cut off. The next slide actually highlights the importance of bone microarchitecture um, in uh, preventing bone fragility. So when you go to the next slide, yeah. So as we all are now aware, BMD alone cannot assess the fracture. This is one of the important limitations of Texas scan. And 60% of women with fragility fractures 
have bone density in the osteopenic range or sometimes they can have normal bone density. We still see uh, fractures happening in that range of bone mineral density. These are usually hi highlighted in our FRAX uh, algorithm and FRAX calculators, which are country specific and uh, specific to various ethnicities. So history prior fracture is an important predictor. And another important predictor is parental history of the fracture, smoking, steroid use, alcohol intake, So, Tisha is not audible now. Maybe there is a problem. Dr. Nisha, you are not audible now. Dr. Nisha, you are not audible. Shall we do one thing? Shall we uh, proceed with the next program? And uh, when we have a better reception, we can come back to this uh, talk once again. Yeah. Veena, uh, kindly stop sharing the screen. Okay. Yeah. Kathy, um, we can go ahead with the next uh, debate. And then once again, we'll come back to the uh, talk, Dr. Nisha's talk. So let's go to the next program. So next, we're having an interesting debate on therapeutic aspects of osteoporosis. The last two decades have seen many new drugs coming into treatment of osteoporosis. And broadly, these can be categorized as those that build up the bone or bone anabolics and those that prevent bone loss that is or bone anti -resorptives. Now, does anyone, does one of these have an advantage over the other? Now, this is a topic of our debate today. And to chair this debate, we have Dr. Binoy J. Paul. He's one of the pioneer rheumatologists of Kerala, former professor of medicine at Medical College Calicut, professor of medicine and chief of rheumatology AMC Medical College, He's a former national secretary and vice president of Indian Rheumatology Association. Our speakers are Dr. Matthew John and Dr. Praveen VP. To chair the debate and to introduce the topic, I invite Dr. Binoy J. Paul. So, thank you. Can you hear me now? The, there was some problem with the net here also. Yeah, yes, sir. You are clear. Very clear. Good evening to all. Uh, we are moving to the debate and we will have a uh, Dr. Nisha's talk after this. The therapeutic armamentarium of osteoporosis has advanced substantially in the last one decade. For any osteoporotic treatment, calcium and vitamin D supplementation form the backdrop of uh, our therapy. But now we have uh, two groups of drugs. 
the anabolic agent the prototype is the cherry paradise of course strontium also has got some anabolic actions and we have another big group the active agents estrogen paroxetine calcitonin bisphosphonate and even denosumab come in that group so we are going to have a debate between the these two groups of drugs the anti resorptive agents the speaker is uh, dr matthew john who is the consultant endocrinologist at the providence endocrine and diabetic center trivandrum dr john did his uh, md from cmc bellur and dm from km hospital mumbai he has over more than 40 publications and he is the principal investigator of many phase 3 trials of drugs on diabetes osteoporosis growth hormone etc he was also the organizing secretary of the endocrine society of india 2017 for the other side for anabolics we have another very impressive speaker dr vp praveen who is the clinical professor of endocrinology at the amrita institute of medical sciences kochi he did his md from medical college kottayam and dm from sgpj lucknow he is a brilliant academician with a special interest in pediatric pediatric endocrinology so first i invite dr matthew john he will be speaking for anti resorptives for 25 minutes followed by professor praveen who will be also spending another 25 minutes on a various uh, anabolic and then we will have a, a rebuttal of 2 minutes for the first speaker and 1 minute for the second speaker and then we will have a discussion now i invite dr matthew john to start his presentation um i hope my uh, screen is visible uh, vishad yeah absolutely yeah thank you binoy sir uh, for the introduction uh, thank you uh, vishad for inviting me here for this uh, talk uh, and uh, i'm extremely uh, extremely happy to see uh, dr debashish danda who has been my teacher and uh, has been one of her, my inspirations i would sometimes think that if i was not in endocrinology i would have been in rheumatology Uh, but at that point of time, uh, we didn't have a DM uh, course in Bello. So uh, I'll be speaking on anti-resorptive. So when Vishad gave me this topic, I was telling Vishad uh, there is, in fact, there is no debate. Each of these molecules have a place to uh, be in the treatment of osteoporosis. But definitely, I think it is good to go through each of these molecules and see whether one molecule can be superior to another in terms of any of these aspects of uh, bone bone or osteoporosis management so i'll run through this uh, i look at the mechanism of action of anti resorptives i look at outcomes adverse effects special situation and uh, challenges and at every point uh, if there is anything which contrasts it uh, to a anabolic uh, i will uh, just uh, mention that particular aspect and finally i will have a comparison uh, praveen is my batchmate and good friend uh, uh, welcome praveen so uh, if you look at the drugs for osteoporosis uh, and if you put uh, bisphosphonates if you put anti resorptives as a category you would include uh, other than the bisphosphonates and denosumab uh, estrogen serms and calcitonin i think we won't have a debate on the last three because uh, those are uh, things like uh, which are very seldom used for proper management of osteoporosis in our practice when it comes to anabolic uh, uh, recombinant pth in various forms uh, romosumab and strontium ranadate uh, is again uh, three of the things and again uh, just like i told on the other side uh, we won't have a debate on strontium ranadate uh, again very seldom used at least in my practice bisphosphonates basically bind to the bone and inhibit osteoclasts in the bone surface that is the reason why they are called anti resorptives so uh, bisphosphonates act on differentiated osteoclast they bind to the bone and then they are taken up by the mature differentiated osteoclast and it inhibits osteoclast mediated bone resorption when it comes to denosumab it's a rang ligand inhibitor and it inhibits osteoclast formation function and survival so basically uh, the denosumab the rang ligand inhibitor will form a much more potent anti resorptive in comparison to bisphosphonate so if you look at this picture you would see that uh, 
osteoclast precursor to osteoclast differentiated osteoclast is inhibited and from uh, differentiated osteoclast it prevents osteoclast function and survival so very potent uh, uh, anti resorptic just to uh, revise this mechanisms because uh, that it is important to know that these are two different mechanisms of acting on osteoclast because if you look at data in terms of fracture prevention again denosumab has got some advantages over uh, bisphosphonates in terms of fracture reduction now coming to outcomes uh, although we are talking about uh, newer methods of looking at outcomes the hard outcome remains still remains the same the outcomes are fractures in people with osteoporosis although uh, uh, and the second outcome which is of importance is the bone mineral density just like nisha has told there is strong relationship between bone density and fractures but that is probably not the only thing which decides fractures in people with osteoporosis now running through the data i don't want to individually dwell into data but this is the meta analysis uh, 2017 meta analysis of uh, bisphosphonates uh, if you and this is not it is a uh, routine meta analysis not a sort of network meta analysis and if you look at that overall fracture rate reduction close to 40% with bisphosphonate vertebral fractures 45 percentage and uh, non vertebral fractures 27 percentage varies across trials varies across comparisons across various groups of patients being studied but this is the general sort of significant reduction in uh, fractures both vertebral and non vertebral with bisphosphonates now i didn't want to put solid ronate into the same bracket as the other oral bisphosphonates i thought i would take it separately because of the sheer importance of this molecule which we have uh, increase which we are increasingly using in our practice for this i am falling back on the horizon a pivotal fracture trial this is a multicentric double blind placebo control trial more than 7000 patients or rather close to 8000 patients randomized between solid ronate acid once yearly versus placebo the initial follow up time was 3 years primary outcomes were new vertebral fractures uh, and hip fractures among all participants there are two categories look at the inclusion criteria post menopausal women with uh, uh, one of the following things that is a t score less than minus 2.5 at femoral neck with or without vertebral fractures or between 1.5 to uh, less t score less than 1.5 with two or more vertebral fractures on imaging so very strict uh, inclusion criteria in terms of uh, randomizing older people with significant osteoporosis you can see how dramatically solitronic acid works in, for this patients so you can see the annual incidence of vertebral fractures from year 1 to year 2 year 0 to year 2 and zero, year 0 to year 3 you can see the relative risk of vertebral fractures dramatically improved uh, rr is 0.4 for the first year 0.29 for first two years and uh, 0.30 for the first three years so consistent reduction in vertebral fractures is what uh, horizon pft has shown us and if you look at the other things hip fractures 41% reduction non vertebral fractures 25 percentage any clinical fractures 33 percentage and clinical vertebral fractures 77 percentage uh, reduction so dramatic improvement in both vertebral fractures and hip fractures and all fracture endpoints horizon pft was further continued to 6 years after the initial 3 years where people who were on the placebo arm were put into the solitronic acid arm and you can see again how the bone density has behaved in these people over the next 6 years it did not stop there it got extended to the 9 years and again you can see the consistent reduction in bone density uh, improvements in bone density on the reduction the improvements in bone density which it has produced over a period of 9 years so molecule which has been in practice and in trials for 9 years consistently followed up with very little adverse effects solidronic is one molecule you can't miss out on data to look at in the continuity arm of uh, horizon pft looking at 6 years data looking at the morphometric vertebral fractures you can see the consistent reduction and even uh, after uh, even in the extensive study you can see that even when you discontinue solitronic acid after the first 3 years you continue to have benefits in terms of non vertebral fractures in the horizon pft trial so this is what uh, a molecule which is consistently improving bone densities consistently producing reduction in both vertebral fractures over a long period of time now if you look at 
uh, another trial of solidronic acid this is uh, the recurrent fracture trial again very impressive data this in which solidronic acid 5 mg yearly within 3 months of a hip fracture surgical manipulation of a hip fracture was given you can see again consistent in improvement in any fracture risk by 35 percentage non vertebral fractures by close to 30 percentage clinical vertebral fractures by 46 percentage and hip fractures by 77 percentage but this is one of those beautiful data which has shown that there's a mortality reduction of close to 30 percentage in people who have sustained a hip fracture on follow-up for three years so again no other molecule has shown a sort of mortality improvement other than solidronic acid and in this particular trial. To just put everything into summary in terms of uh, relative risk reduction, this is what it looks like. Uh, 40 to 60 percentage of relative risk reduction in terms of uh, vertebral fractures and 40 to 50 percentage reduction in terms of uh, fractures of the hip. Now coming to our next molecule, that is the denosumab. Uh, I'm not going into the meta-analysis for this particular molecule because of the heterogeneity. I'll rather stick on to one trial, that is the Freedom uh, Pivotal Phase three trial for Denisumab. This is, again, a very important trial for the fact that you had a trial going on for the first three years, and then you have an extension for the next seven years. So a total of 10 years of study of Denisumab. Again, study population, huge, 8,000 patients, T-score less than minus 2.5 at lumbar spine or total hip. Uh, but uh, more than point, minus 0.4. And primary endpoint is new vertebral fracture. Secondary endpoint is non-vertebral or hip fractures. Again, you can see the uh, beautiful data of uh, change in bone density from baseline for the, both the primary group, which continue to receive denosumab. That is the blue line, which goes on top, the light blue line, which goes on top. And the, uh, the lower line, which goes in the bottom, is the people who received placebo initially, then getting crossed over to denosumab. So consistent increase in both uh, bone density in both total hip and lumbar spine can be seen here. Similarly, this data got continued. Uh, this is the up to 10 years data. I'm showing you the 10 years data. You can again see the sort of consistent improvement uh, in uh, bone densities in uh, both at the femoral neck and the distal radius. Now coming to the primary outcomes of this trial in terms of uh, vertebral and uh, new vertebral fractures and uh, non-vertebral fractures, consistent reduction of both with uh, denosumab, both during the initial three years of the trial and also during the extension part of the trial. So there is no doubt that anti resorptis as a class have shown consistent benefit, both in terms of BMD improvement and in terms of fracture reduction, whatever be the fractures. Now, uh, the important reason why I think a debate like this has been proposed is because of the concerns regarding the adverse effects of uh, uh, anti resorptives So again, we look into the bisphosphonates adverse effects and the denosumab adverse effects. So if you go back, uh, I think uh, people who have been in the osteoporosis field would not be forgetting this uh, editorial, which I've shown in the lower right part uh, Crisis, addressing the crisis of treatment of osteoporosis is a path forward. This is which came in uh, JBMR in 2016. That's by Sandeep Kosla. And you can see how world's premier newspapers like the New, New York Times have taken up this thing. So when osteonecrosis of the jaw came in and the atypical uh, femoral fractures came in, this was one major setback for the use of bisphosphonates. So again, uh, if the way you put it across to people is what really matters, because if you look at, uh, if you read through this uh, uh, New York Times article, you can see that uh, causing jaw bones to rot and thigh bones to break. So these are uh, statements which are very sort of negatively playing on people's psyche. And now, even now, you have the Lancet Rheumatology putting up this editorial in 2020 February saying the crisis of inadequate treatment in osteoporosis. So bisphosphonates being our primary drugs, this sort of adverse effects, which are very, very rare and limited to certain high-risk characteristics, has deferred the use of bisphosphonates. So let us see how important these adverse effects are in real practice. Now, bisphosphonates, we know that uh, it is contraindicated in certain disorders like those affecting the esophagus, ecclesia cardia, esophageal stricture, etc. If you have varices, if you have uh, people with cirrhosis and varices, you are not supposed to give bisphosphonates. Certain types of bariatric surgery is a contraindication for oral bisphosphonates. EGFR less than 30 or 35 is again a contraindication. 
acute uh, flu like symptoms and musculoskeletal pain after iv solidronic acid is very well known and even with oral solidronic acid the initial when you start off there are patients who complain of a musculoskeletal pain barring these two adverse effects adverse effects with ad alendronate or any bisphosphonate oral or intravenous bisphosphonate is extremely rare you can have idiosyncratic ocular adverse effects you can have very rare cases of acute renal dysfunction primarily related to people with uh, malignancies like multiple myeloma and diuretic use which is associated so choose your patients wisely when it comes to complications like rare complications like atypical femur fractures you can see the percentage which i mentioned 0.31 percentage in more than 5 years use osteonecrosis of the jaw extremely extremely uncommon 0.0004 percentage uh, we are all aware of dental precautions to be taken seen with higher doses seen with people who receive more than an year dose of solidronic acid atrial fibrillation no definite cause and effect across uh, cause and effect found not consistent across trials in very long term trials like the horizon uh, there was an increased risk of atrial fibrillation requiring hospitalization in people who are in the solidronic act and very inconsistent esophageal cancer again a concern but no consistent cause and effect relationship has been seen so if you put this into a picture in terms of atypical femoral fractures which was one of the most uh, sort of annoying adverse effects you can see how different it is in terms of fractures that you could prevent by the use of bisphosphonates than the fractures you would cause with the amount of bisphosphonates i realized that you can't even see the line when the bisphosphonate use was 2 years and when you see the 8 year use of bisphosphonates you can see it is only 78 cases per 100000 person years in comparison to major osteoporotic fracture prevention in high risk women now denosumab again the adverse effects which are common or minor that is back pain extremity pains musculoskeletal pains these are adverse effects or hypercholesterolemia these were adverse effects reported in clinical trials to the more than 5 percentage of patients rare adverse effects include hypocalcemia in people who have renal dysfunction or people who are prone to hypocalcemia like vitamin d deficiency or malabsorption osteonecrosis of the jaw atypical femoral fractures reported with denosumab extremely uncommon multiple vertebral fractures following discontinuation is again a known adverse effects of denosumab but then we all know this adverse effects and we have very strict guidelines on how people with such adverse effects should be prevented and how it should be managed uh, there has been concern about infections in people being a monoclonal antibody but there is no consistent data on that there has been concerns regarding the use of two monoclonal antibodies for a disease like rheumatoid arthritis with osteoporosis again no major cause and effect in terms of uh, increased risk of infections coming to the last two three uh, part, last two parts of my talk looking at special situations that is osteopenia in postmenopausal women glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis bone protection protection in people with treated malignancies so i think nisha also uh, gave you a similar data who gets osteoporotic fracture osteoporotic fracture if you look at this uh, large observational study of more than 2 lakh population this is the nora cohort you could see that osteoporosis is strongly related to bone density but the number of women who develop osteoporosis is not related to the absolute bone density because if you look at the total number of fractures which occur in people with osteopenia versus people with osteoporosis osteopenic people have an absolute number of increased fractures so you can see that 82% of the people who reported fractures in this trial had a peripheral bone density scores which were more than 2.5 that is it's not less than 2.5 so it is not in the osteoporotic range so hardly 18% of overall fractures in this cohort occurred in women with uh, osteoporosis now solidronic acid has got a very good trial in fracture prevention in people with osteoporosis in osteopenic subjects and this is uh, again ambulatory postmenopausal women more than 65 years a uh, t score of minus 1 to minus 2.5 total hip of femoral and you can see the outcome was time to first occurrence of a fragility fracture consistent data across first fragility fractures non vertebral fragility fractures symptomatic fractures changes in height in people with osteopenia again there is no data with use of teriparatide or any bone anabolic in people with osteopenia where the maximum number of fractures can occur second is glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis this is one area where teriparatide 
seems to be having an advantage over uh, bisphosphonates. Uh, it's not uh, uh, just for me not to mention this point, which is in favor of uh, teriparatide. This is one of those data which try to compare uh, teriparatide against uh, risidronate uh, uh, in terms of fracture risk. So what you can see is that uh, the BMD was improved in those with teriparatide, but look at uh, uh, what happened to the fractures. You can see that uh, vertebral fractures did in fact reduce in people using teriparatide than alentronate, but uh, non-vertebral fractures, there was no advantage and numerically more number of patients in teriparatide now. Uh, this is a good trial, but I won't take this trial too much to heart because of the high discontinuation rates of patients, 30 percentage. Final radiological evaluation fra fractures or vertebral fractures only in 80 percent of patients and not the best of bisphosphonates for comparison in such a scenario. And you are all aware from Dr. Danda's talk yesterday that uh, glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis is a very a sort of heterogeneous condition with both the glucocorticoid and the primary disease contributing to the osteoporosis and osteoporotic fracture. So very, very difficult area to find one drug better than the other. The last part of this is the bone protection in people with treated malignancy. I think uh, we don't need to go too much further into this. Two areas where we need osteoporotic protection is one, in people with breast cancer who are on aromatase inhibitors or LHRH analogs and men with uh, prostatic carcinoma who are on antigen deprivation therapy. Solidronic acid, excellent benefits in people with uh, breast cancer who are prone to osteoporosis, both in terms of change in BMD and reduction in vertebral fractures. Similar data with uh, denosumab in people with uh, prostate uh, cancer, uh, showing fracture reduction uh, and improvement in BMD. So no, no more uh, discussion on this. Uh, there is no data with uh, any of the bone anabolics in this scenario. Male osteoporosis. Again, both these drugs have been used. Reparatide has been found to uh, have some advantage in terms of absolute BMD increase. But reduction in vertebral fractures has been seen with all agents, salentronate, solitronate, denisumab, and teriparatide, And limited hip fracture data with any agent of the four. In glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis in men, in subgroup analysis, teriparatide was found to be superior. Now, if you look at the experience of using drugs over a period of years, alentronate, we have studies over 10 years, risidronate, seven years, solitronate, nine years, denosumab, 10 years. No bone anabolic has got this sort of a long data, nothing more than 36 months with teriparatide. Coming to people with compromised renal functions, again, denosumab has got a definite scoring here. There is no EGFR cutoff for denosumab. You can continue to use denosumab. And uh, uh, for postgraduates, if you look at the reference, the last reference by Jamal, this is the freedom data, which showed people at different levels of EGFR having no increased adverse effects uh, or changes in bone density with the use of denosumab. Now for the comparison, postmenopausal osteoporosis, uh, both of them are good enough, post uh, antiresorptives and anabolics, preventing fractures in postmenopausal women with osteopenia, that is a label indication for antiresorptives, not a label approval for teriparatide. Glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, first line treatment is always bisphosphonates in severe cases. And in American College of, uh, Radio of Rheumatology, there is a second line indication for teriparatide. Malignancy associated, CA prostate and CA breast, indication is only for antiresorptives. Data on hip fracture reduction, good with antiresorptives, not consistent with anabolics. Long duration of studies, consistently with antiresorptives, pathetic with anabolics. Cost of therapy, low with antiresorptives, high with anabolics. Convenience, oral or annual injections. Anabolics are injectables with daily injections. Adverse effects are there, but mild and infrequent. Uh, severe adverse effects are infrequent with bisphosphonates, and mild, and mild adverse effects are frequent. Whereas uh, from this perspective, anabolics are good, but not beyond data beyond two years. And finally, part of it, untold challenges in osteoporosis therapy, this cost effectiveness, persistence, and adherence. Cost effectiveness, I think uh, I don't need to explain this further. Various data from systems which use payers and which is not using payers, ins insurance-based data, showing that uh, cost per quality ad adjusted life years is much better with bisphosphonates than with uh, teriparatide. 
So this is various data from various countries. I've just put it up. And persistence of therapy. Any therapy which works is the therapy which you can continue to take year after year. And this is a database from the Taiwan. It's an insurance database to show you that at six months, the persistence of teriparatide is 50 percentage, and at 12 months, it is 25 percentage. I think this is not unusual in many patients using teriparatide in our scenario. Uh, I'm not saying that I don't use uh, teriparatide. I definitely use teriparatide. But if you look at data, BMD data, good with teriparatide versus oral bisphosphonates and with IV bisphosphonates. But femoral neck data, not good. Lumbar spine data is good. Femoral neck data is not good. Vertebral fractures, both have advantages. Hip fractures, uh, again, this limited to bisphosphonates. Denusumab, again, compare, these are all direct comparison studies. I'm not looking at studies versus uh, uh, network meta-analysis. These are direct comparison studies and meta-analysis of those studies. Denusumab, similar BMD changes according with similar to teriparatide for both lumbar spine and femoral neck. Uh, not reported in studies uh, of fractures with these agents. And again, this is a network meta-analysis, one of the largest ones, close to two lakh patients. You can see that both uh, solidronate and residronate have, and alendronate have good data on uh, hip fractures, but none of the teriparatide studies have data on hip fractures. So to end the talk, I'll ask you and I'll ask you to take a decision, which is the one anti-osteoporosis drug that you can't leave without. I don't need to give the answer. It is obviously a bisphosphonate. You can't leave without a bisphosphonate, but you could always survive and thrive without a bone anabolic agent. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matthew John, for your excellent arguments for anti -resorptive. Now we will invite Dr. Praveen to talk about uh, anabolics. Dr. Praveen, please. Yeah. Uh, am I visible and audible? Yes. Yes, Praveen. Yeah. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, enjoyed Matthew's talk. Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Vishad and the IRIS team for this uh, pleasant diversion this COVID time. I would also like to thank Binoy sir for the kind introduction. So uh, I've been asked to defend the anabolic agents and as Matthew said, both have their place in the management of uh, osteoporosis. Uh, since uh, uh, we couldn't complete uh, Dr. Nisha's talk, uh, let me just sketch the osteoporosis management landscape in a minute. So basically most of osteoporosis is about fractures. We are trying to prevent fractures in various forms, vertebral, non-vertebral. And we have the X-rays and the VFA for detecting fractures. And uh, of late in the last 10 to 15 years, we have moved forward we are trying to prevent fractures before fractures occur. So we are looking at risk factors. The FRAGS helps us to score the fracture risk. We have the BMD, and recently we have the trabecular bone score as well. And what do we try to achieve with therapy? Therapy, obviously, it's about fracture reduction. The best data is from RCTs, individual comparisons. Then there are meta-analysis data. One of the problems with meta-analysis here is like, we are not just comparing two agents. We need to compare more than two agents. So we have the network meta-analysis for this. So for the individual patient, we look at improvement in BMT. For anti resorptives we also look at the bone markers. And the most accepted bone markers are the P1NP and the CTX. And there are other rarefied techniques which uh, Dr. Nisha will be using, like, for example, the histomorphometric analysis. And of late, there is a use of this uh, high-resolution PQCT and the engineering technique, finite element analysis, to look at the bone strength. So that is us in the first quarter 
of the 21st century. Let me put forth a case to bring forth arguments in favor of anabolic therapy. So this is a 53 year old lady is under follow up with hypopituitarism, acquired hypopituitarism. So uh, premature menopause, of course, and her height was okay. So obviously we could interpret the bone mineral density. Obviously the positioning is not that great. You can see that there is a scoliosis and there's just one vertebra which is in the midline. But it's easy to see that there is a significant amount of osteoporosis and you can see that even in the X-ray, there is at least one clearly visualized fracture. And BFA shows that there are multiple vertebral fractures. So in this lady, the question is, which therapy would you prefer? Would you start on bisphosphonate, wait for a couple of years, do a BMD and see another fracture? Or would you like to pump it up, go fast forward and then try to reduce fracture risk? So I will leave this case at this juncture and then go on to key discussion points. So we'll just look at the state uh, changing treatment philosophy in osteoporosis now and uh, look at anabolic agents, uh, the mechanistic aspects as well. And then we will look at the real thing. We are not just talking about single agents now. We are moving on to a next phase. We are looking at sequential therapy, we are looking at combination therapy. We want to reduce the risk more and as fast as possible and maintain it. We want to prevent fractures and that's the basic aim. And of course, for rheumatologists, there are some special considerations uh, when talking about anabolic agents, which will be discussed very briefly. So osteoporosis is not just one single thing. It comes with different fracture risks. So, I think uh, uh, as per the American College of Rheumatology Guidelines 2017, there are uh, three risk categories and endocrine society has an additional risk factor with a very high fracture risk. So let's start with the very high fracture risk. It's very simple to define. Very high fracture risk means multiple spine fractures and uh, BMT classically less than 2.5 T-score. And so all, both these criteria have to be satisfied. High is any or any one of a spine fracture. It's a, it's a wrong thing. There are no multiple, just a single spine fracture, single fracture of the hip with an estimated FRAC score. We are all aware of the FRAC score significance, 3% and 20% or a BMD, just a low BMD alone. And then there are these lower categories of moderate and low risk for fractures. It's important, very important to realize that once you get a fracture, especially the vertebral fracture, the risk of subsequent fractures is very high. You can see the percentages and it varies from study to study, but it's rather high. And our main aim is to prevent another vertebral fracture. So this is a classical paradigm, which you used to follow probably till five to 10 years back. So it starts with the premise that bisphosphonates are the most proven ones and most cost effective. Uh, so you start with the bisphosphonates after a BMT and a PRAX, and then you try to uh, look at the bond mineral density response, one to two yearly response, see if it is stable, and or if it is increasing, you are happy. And what happens if you fracture? Then you go on to more powerful agents, including antibiotics. So that is a classical paradigm. So something which has come up in the last three to four years is something which has been used familiar to both endocrinologists as well as rheumatologists, three to target. The three to target is basically aimed at fracture reduction. So if the risk is high, why do you want to wait? Start with the treatment, which will reduce the risk maximally and fast. And there is no generally agreed upon target to treat, but there is some sort of expert consensus that you should try for a BMD, which is better than 2.5. So obviously you have to use agents which are likely to achieve the objective in the shortest time. 
So this is where the anabolic agents come. So let's uh, uh, use uh, 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 cartoon to understand the basic principles of osteopin uh, anabolic therapy. So this is uh, Shamila Tagore in her uh, 20s. So uh, it's the, her bone is not static. It's a dynamic environment. So there are these, uh, uh, whenever she develops uh, uh, bone, slight bone injury, then there are these osteoclasts which come and try to resolve the bone, both the matrix as well as the mineral is resolved. And there is a cavity and the cavity is slowly filled up. So this bone resorption takes just around a month. There is this process of primary mineralization, which takes a few weeks. And that's only partial filling of the cavity. And then there is this secondary mineralization, which takes years. So it's a kind of long drawn out process. So even if there is a cavity, it's not filled immediately. It takes years to fill it but it just gets filled. So that is for sure. And this is very true of our younger days. So this part is very active. This is called remodeling. And as she gets older, just around the age of 50 years, something else happens. This process slows down. The resorption is less. And more so often, the mineralization also is less. And the mineralization deficit is more than the resorption deficit. So we go into a sort of slowed down phase irreversible deficit. And that is what happens in aging. So what happens is antiresorptives. Antiresorptives actually inhibits the osteoclast as was well put forth by Matthew. So it actually inhibits this stage, but this irreversible defect, there is no action of antiresorptives. So there is some amount of resorption going on still. Whatever BMD gain, which occurs with antiresorptives, is the process of the secondary mineralization, which takes years. It does happen. So remodeling is about reconstruction. Now, what about anabolics? Anabolics is like you have almost slightly reverse the age of Shamil Tago. So suddenly there is a sudden activity all around. So the remodeling picks up. So this whole process becomes active and the irreversible element comes down. So it's like, you're almost like, uh, although it's not exactly true, you're like getting a younger bone. So it's a bone building process all around. What about modeling? So remodeling is about reconstruction and modeling is about construction. So here, osteoblasts by themselves lay down the bone. There is no osteoclastic preceding action. And most of it is about bone laying. Of course, there is a bone destruction element very early on life, which is very helpful for the proper bone shape. But most of adults, it's about anabolic process. So this is about laying down more bone. And this is what anabolics do. do. They have a profound stimulatory effect on the modeling aspect. Except for the permissive effects of denosumab, none of the other agents and resorptives have a strong age stimulatory agent on the modeling, which is a very important aspect of bone building. So uh, I think it is very clear that this aspect of bone building is very important and anabolics are the right agents for proper bone building. So let's get introduced the agents. This is all well known to you all, the teriparatide and abeloparatide. So uh, people think that there are two confirmations and of the PTH receptor, both of them act on the PTH receptor and the r zero confirmation is more favored by teriparatide. And there is, as you can see here, there's a prolonged cyclic HMP response. Here, if there is less prolonged cyclic AMP response. Hello? Hello? Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yeah, okay. Right. So it seems like this intermittent 
action of the PTH or the PTHRP is more profound here, and this is supposed to have a more anabolic effect. As, you, as we can see in most of the trials, abeloparatide has more BMD gains at least when compared to the teriparatide. So what are the mechanisms? So there is initial stimulation of the bone resorption. There is decreased ap apoptosis of those to blast, decreased sclerostin production, and there is decreased anabolic activity. So it's like the bone has come to life. And most of it is remodeling based, and there is 20% is modeling based. So the risk reduction, as Matthew very elegantly put, the vertebral fracture reduction is very profound here. So you can see that varies across trials, but you can safely say that it's uh, the latest trials, that it's around 80% uh, for both teriparatide as well as abeloparatide. There are no good data regarding hip fracture risk. One of the reasons is that none of these trials had a large number of patients with hip fracture. That is one of the reasons. There are other reasons also because these agents have more action on the trabecular bone. And it's more, and uh, hip is where you get a lot of cortical bone as well. So it's a combination. So it makes sense that it will have more action on the uh, trabecular bone and the spine. So this is the kinetic model of the PTH as an anabolic agent. There is first uh, uh, increase in the bone formation markers. So kick starts everything and then the bone resorption markers also pick up. And there are various important considerations when you use uh, teriparatide. The postal hypertension is something which you have to take care of. All of us are aware of it and PTH should not be elevated too much. Of course, there is, it's, it doesn't have a proven effect on hip fractures for the reasons which I mentioned. And there is a need to give anti-receptive therapy after two years. So let's look at the endocrine society guidelines. What does it say? Uh, there is a 2019 endocrine society guidelines and a 2020 update. So this is where teriparatide and abeloparatide has been put. It is recommended in patients with high risk of, very high risk of fracture. Both denisumab and other anti have been put in high risk. So this is a class of agents which has been put in or recommended for very high risk of fractures. And obviously, this is for vertebral and non-vertebral fractures. And the benefit is not there for hip fractures. Obviously, they have also recommended that we follow it up with anti-resorptive therapy. Romanosubmab is a new agent, uh, 210 microgram once monthly, yet to reach Indian stores. So I'll cut the story short here. So this is about inhibition of the sclerostin. Sclerostin is an inhibitor, inhibitor of the beta catenin WNT pathway which is a bone forming pathway. So basically osteoplasts are activated. And so sclerostin inhibits that. And our romanosumab, it's an antibody to sclerostin. So inhibits the sclerostin mediated inhibition. So it results in an anabolic action. So the endocrine society, again, the 2020 update, puts it as an agent, which is recommended for very high risk of fracture. And we already had a look at what very high fracture means. And there is at least one trial comparison with result rate in which even hip fracture risk has been shown to be lower with romanosumab. So it's recommended even for hip fracture. Obviously, it's for one year. And the thing to remember is that there is some cardiovascular risk associated. So people with prior myocardial infarction, stroke, and high cardiovascular risk, you are not supposed to use this agent. Odonosatib is out of the picture due to cardiovascular risk. So there are various trials with uh, Romanosumab. So I just uh, look at uh, one trial, which particularly the FAME trial, which looked very interesting. So this is a trial which looked at uh, one year use of Romanosumab compared to placebo. And this was followed up with Denisumab. And you can see that the vertebral fracture risk was down by 
around 73 percentage. So both in the initial phase when compared to the placebo, as well as in the continuation phase of remdesivir, the prior use of remdesivir was found to be beneficial, and it was whopping gains in BMD was seen. So what are the potential benefits of anabolic therapy or antiresorptives? So there are benefits. The one of the major benefits is the improvement of the microarchitecture. There, the downside is that the cortical porosity increases, but people think that even though the cortical porosity increases, which may not be very beneficial for cortex predominant bones, it is in the long run, it's supposed to increase the strength. Again, the risk of, of course, these are not very significant risks. The risk of uh, ONG and atypical femoral fractures are not there with most of the agents. It's uh, seen with the Romanus of map. So why it is important it is because this is one agent which you can use when you have patients uh, who have significant risk of ONG or develop ONG. So as a long-term agent, most of the time in androsoptis, we are going to end up with a long-term stiff bone. But here, we have a better bone to start off with on which we can build on. Obviously, it cannot use it for a long term because of the risk of uh, the potential risk of osteosarcoma. And again, there are experts who feel that there may be some detrimental effects on the cortical bone on long term use. So it's very difficult to compare these agents. So let's uh, use uh, the help of a network analysis data. So this is something which was published last year. If you look at the relative benefit of these agents, you can see that uh, most of these agents, the anabolic agents, sort of are ahead of these other agents, except for uh, solundronate with regards to vertebral fractures with a very significant relative risk reduction when compared to placebo. Of course, these data are all with comparison with placebo. And this is also true for non vertebral fractures. The effect is supposed to be much better than the androsoptis. The hip fracture is one area where the anabolics do not fare very well. So let's uh, look at the paradigm of sequential and combination therapy. So we'll start off with some trials which compare anabolic therapy versus androsoptic therapy. So this is one trial which Matthew already uh, mentioned. So basically there are two trials with fracturous endpoints which have compared anabolic therapy and androsoptics. One is a Vero trial. Patients uh, just for two years, patients with previous fracture, teriparatide versus alendronate. And vertebral fracture reduction with teriparatide when compared with alendronate was 50 percent each. So this was very significant. Of course, there are other problems which Matthew mentioned. Art study. So this studied patients with vertebral fracture mostly. There are very few patients with hip fractures. One year of bromonosumab versus alendronate and followed by continuation of alendronate for 33 months. Again, the people who were followed up for 33 months, people who received bromonosumab had a greater benefit for vertebral fracture reduction as well as clinical fracture reduction. So very robust data when compared, comparing anabolic data and antibiotic, but there are just two, uh, two studies. There are other studies, at least two other studies, which are which do not have fracture as endpoints. And one of these studies are in relation to osteoporosis in glucocorticoid use patient, which I'll mention on com coming slides. Let's look at the sequential therapy now. So this is a paradigm which has come up, which is the best sequence to use. So do you use anabolics first? Do you use uh, androsoptis first? So uh, to, in the interest of the time, I'll just briefly mention the beneficial sequences. Teriparatide followed by bisphosphonates. Teriparatide or abeloparatide followed by denosumab and teriparatide plus denosumab followed by either denosumab and solenronate have been found to be 
very beneficial both and most of the data is regard to bmd the fracture risk reduction is slowly coming up one detrimental sequence which should be avoided is denizumab followed by cheriparatide and when you use bisphosphonate followed by teriparatide romanesumab again the beneficial effects of the anabolic therapy is blunted so these are some of the things which should be kept in mind so the only combination therapy which is worth mentioning is a data study which combined teriparatide with denosumab and this study had bmd as its end points and you can see that the bmd gain with the com combination therapy in all the groups the lumbar spine total hip femoral leg and radial shaft was much better than either group that is either teriparatide or denosumab so so this is an exciting study which shows that uh, instead of fighting among the uh, groups you can actually compare the two agents to elicit major beneficial effects and faster probably faster fracture reduction now let's look at some key rheumatological considerations so rheumatological connotations of uh, osteoporosis are rather complicated you have a disease which by itself is causing bone resorption you have the use of glucocorticoids uh, which can increase remodeling and again inhibit uh, osteoblast so prophylaxis there is no doubt bisphosphonates are the first drugs to be used and denosumab has additional anti joint destructive property but in established osteoporosis there is with and severe risk of uh, fractures or fractures teriparatide goes over alendronate and this is the pivotal study which was published in ngm matthew has already mentioned that uh, so i wouldn't delve on it much but this is an interesting study which was published in 2017 and there are similar studies in 2020 teriparatide versus jonasma in patients who were treated with bisphosphonates so they had this patients fired on alendronate and they were switched to either denosumab and teriparatide you can see that again in this study the endpoints were bmd and trabecular bone score you can see that teriparatide sort of thrashed both denosumab and the continuation of bisphosphonate group so the significant gains to the tune of around 9 percentage so there is another trial which i have not put up uh, similar uh, results which came up last month so it seems like in a comparison between tenesumab and teriparatide and denosumab in patients who are treated with bisphosphonates there is a distinct advantage of teriparatide so let's look at what the endocrine society uh, says for one last time so this is the i won't go through this table in detail so they have this high and very risk high uh, very high risk category which i have already defined and in the text it's very clearly mentioned that very high risk patients very high risk patients the agents to be chosen are from the antibodies so either you go for teriparatide or abelaparatide or romanosumab of course the use of these agents should be restricted for 2 years for teriparatide and abelaparatide and one year for romanosumab so i think it's very clear that anabolic agents are here to stay uh, it's not for everyone low risk agents is of course bisphosphonates all the way but for very high risk patients to affect fracture reduction especially in the spine these definitely have a role now of course when you come across patients with atypical femoral fracture or osteonecrosis jo again these agents have a role to play and glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis patients with and rheumatoid uh, without rheumatoid arthritis these agents probably will come up as the first line agent soon so so i would like to reiterate the points here so 
there is a paradigm shift here. Lost, so we are going to take the risk on. from now on. And patients with high risk, very high risk, anabolic agents definitely have a role to play. And in future, these agents may even be suggested to be used in patients with not just very high risk, even with high risk. Of course, we cannot forget bisphosphonates and denizumab because the anabolics need to be followed up by at least bisphosphonates. So thank you very much. This is the last slide. Thank you, Dr. Praveen, for the excellent arguments in favor of anabolics. As a whole, I am very happy that both the speakers are very cordial, respecting the indications of the drugs in the other group. I think we can give one, two minutes to Dr. Matthew for uh, talking anything in after Praveen is talking. So he has any, any more arguments? Uh, no, sir. I think, uh, uh, I think Praveen also reiterated the fact that there is a role for uh, both these agents, uh, the management of uh, osteoporosis. And it is uh, up to the decision to fit uh, where a, for, for a risk assessment of a particular patient and uh, fitting that uh, particular therapy to the patient. And I also uh, enjoyed uh, Praveen's uh, talk. There is no rebuttal from my side for this. Uh, but I think bringing out a concept of uh, uh, not just sticking on to one agent, combination of agents and follow-up of agents was a, a good uh, aspect of this that made the talk complete. Thank you. Okay, there are a few questions in the chat box. Before that, I have a question. Both of you believe in drug holiday, especially with bisphosphonate. That concept is still there. Drug holiday. Uh, I think the uh, yes, yes, there is uh, even the 2019 recommendations uh, of the endocrine society has uh, proposed drug holidays in people who are on uh, bisphosphonates. That is usually after five years of uh, oral bisphosphonate or approximately three years of after solidronic acid, uh, depending on the patient risk. And uh, they have a protocol based on the FLEX study to how to follow up these patients. Uh, further to stopping bisphosphonates. It, it is an accepted uh, mode of treatment now, I should say. Praveen, any comments on that? Yeah, Matthew, I think right on the thing as usual. So I think uh, uh, the drug holidays for uh, the same period, almost uh, after three years in IV solenternate, probably you're supposed to look at it again, meaning think about starting it again. And for uh, bisphosphonates, you can be, you know, you can go up with front to as long as five years. I think there's other recommendations. Now, there are a few questions in the chat box. One is duration of treatment. They are asking how long we should give treatment. Uh, bisphosphonates, I think, uh, just like we told, the uh, concept of drug holiday is there. And uh, throughout the drug holiday, every two years assessment of bone density and uh, fracture status. And based on bone density or fracture status, uh, reconsider start of therapy again with a bisphosphonates or with an anabolic, uh, means or with a different form of therapy that is uh, recommended. Uh, data with uh, bisphosphonates up to 10 years, uh, safety issues beyond 10 years is not very clearly described. But at the same time, uh, realizing that osteoporosis is a lifelong disease and care needs to be taken, if not with bisphosphonate, with the next agent. Denusumab uh, data with uh, for five years, uh, reassessment of risk after five years and continuation of denusumab up to 10 years has been recommended. Again, every denusumab stoppage has to be uh, managed uh, usually with a bisphosphonate after a period of say six, seven to eight months with a restarting of a bisphosphonate or a more powerful bone, bone anabolic agent. So that is uh, for uh, bisphosphonates. I think uh, for uh, uh, tetraparatide, uh, the recommendation is maximum of two years and follow up with the bisphosphonate. And uh, romosumab is one year and follow up with the next agent. Uh, Praveen, am I correct? Sure, Matthew. Yeah. That's the duration of treatment. Now, another question is on calcitonin nasal spray. Is it useful? Where will you place it? Praveen, Cal you want to take that? 
yeah i think it's matthew's thing but i think uh, the uh, guidelines are pretty clear about it if no other agent you cannot use any other agent for uh, various reasons then it's probably the last agent uh, there is some benefit uh, but again some vertebral fracture benefit is there but again the last choice can we use it as can we use it as an adjuvant because it is giving very good analgesia yeah? yeah i think acute vertebral pain fracture pain uh, there is a good relief with calcitonin but i am not aware of any any combination therapies there praveen i am not aware of any combination therapy not aware so uh, we are not aware of any combination therapy of course we all use it for the pain thing this is a dramatic relief of pain it is very gratifying but there is question on strontium which has got both anti resorptive and anabolic actions so any role for strontium sir i think uh, in the present day with all these trials and cardiovascular risk data and all those stuff uh, and all this uh, whatsapp news and all i will find it <laughs> you know it's difficult to use the agent again because you know people will pick up all these pieces of information and all those stuff and again uh, the fd is also against that so i think the strontium is kind of uh, gone now what can be the possible risk of giving teriparatide beyond 12 years there is a question 12 months uh, sir uh, actually uh, sir or 12 all... or 1 to 2 years probably 1 uh, to 2 years sir 2 years I, yeah. yeah yeah usually so, we give it for 2 years the question is 1 yeah. to or one, i am not very sure probably he might have uh, thinking of 1 to 2 years not uh, 12 years Two years, two years. Yeah, yeah. Probably two, two years is what he meant. So obviously, sir, the initial consideration was uh, about the osteosarcoma risk, which uh, you know after many years of use, the combined data there is, I think, there is just one case report of osteosarcoma. Uh, so and that that incidence is similar to that in general population. The osteosarcoma risk is not that much, but there are concerns about. loss of cortical bone also is slowly coming up when you use it for a long time as you can see uh, even in the hip and all those stuff there are some subtle data with regard to the cortical porosity uh, it is coming up so that may be an, another reason is there any risk of fracture healing when you osteoconate or uh, anabolics there any delay in fracture healing um i think i had uh, shown the uh, vertebral fracture trial the vft or the after solidronic uh, which is in which solidronic was given within 90 days of a hip fracture surgery and uh, that study did not in fact show uh, i'm i'm not aware but this has been a, a significant concern i think with teriparatide in fact there is data to show that it actually uh, improves or hastens the fast fracture healing including fracture healing of atypical femoral fractures uh, praveen uh, any further take on that uh, solidronic stuff uh, try to target matthew i think uh, sir there is uh, there is some data to suggest that you can use these agents after two weeks of a fracture so it has been uh, mentioned in uh, many places so we wait for uh, after two weeks no detrimental effect on fracture healing yeah uh, just one more thing i think a lot of uh, centers now uh, i think it has been sort of practice to give solidronic acid before the patient gets discharged after a, a femoral fracture repair i think this is to prevent uh, loss of patient follow up and definitely the outcome seems to be better is it necessary to use uh, teriparatide in glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis even uh, mathi was also telling that teriparatide is the drug of choice for glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis i believe that the praveen will be very happy with that statement i think so, sir uh, it's not a, it's a, again about the risk sir. so in uh, it depends on the risk so if the risk is not high and there are no fractures if there are fractures obviously probably matthew would agree i don't know about that matthew you agree with me with fractures yeah. uh, teriparatide would be the first choice Yes, yes, definitely. With fractures, repair trade will be the first choice. And in fact, there is one uh, editorial, I think, which came in three years back or something, 
uh, arguing for the use of first use of glucocortic I mean, steriparatide in glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. Yeah, definitely. Which is the best drug for male osteoporosis? <laughs> I think again, uh, just like Praveen told, it is individualization will form the key. Uh, where you start with, uh, just like the case, the female case which Praveen showed, where you have established fracture risk, uh, definitely, or again, risk classifying the person as a high fracture, very high fracture risk will form the basis of therapy, even for male osteoporosis. There is uh, no large data sets uh, with this thing, and most of the data sets include people with both hypogonadal and eugonadal men when trials are being done. So I think uh, finally, for me, I feel it is uh, the risk uh, classification at uh, presentation which decides which drug to go on. Praveen, uh, your comments, Praveen. I think I agree with you, Matthew. I think that is, uh, uh, there are a few experts who feel that patients with uh, osteopenic range uh, with fractures, uh, you can actually uh, and you are uh, rather young, um, you can go ahead and uh, use antibiotics first, build up the bone, because these are people who have not achieved their uh, peak bone mass or whatever, or have lost in between. So you would build bone and try to maintain it uh, and resolve this. So, but again, that's not a uniformly accepted form of therapy. These are just expert opinions. So, Dr. John, are you agree with the initial use of anabolics followed by anti-resorptive is the best option? Yeah, I think concept-wise, yes. Yeah. So, I think there is more of consensus rather than arguments and counter-arguments between the speakers. It's a very, very good thing. Uh, I think we are running short of time. Uh, Mishab, can we uh, stop? Yes, or sir. would you like to? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I think... Uh... Most of the aspects. It was a very wonderful discussion. Uh, we can conclude, sir. Okay. Okay. I thank, thank both the speakers for their excellent presentation and the consensus has been developed all over the world, including in our meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you, Binar, sir. Thank you, Dr. Matthew and uh, Dr. Praveen. Uh, it was a very lucid and very uh, almost too friendly <laughs> debate. Uh, we'll go to the next topic. Uh, Dr. Nisha is able to join us now. So she's uh, continuing with her talk on uh, bone mineral density interpretation. Uh, over to you, Dr. Nisha. Oh, hi. Uh, if you could share the screen for me, please. I am on uh, slide 13. Thank you. Uh, is it visible? Uh, the next one. Next one. One second. It's it's all right. Yeah, yeah, the one with the picture. Yeah. So I I just wanted to highlight. Sorry, everybody. I think the there was a problem with the internet connection on the road. So I just wanted to highlight the three dimensional architecture of the bone. This is often not captured. Using using a conventional two-dimensional DEXA. So this is the main reason we use advanced modalities such as high-resolution PQCT to differentiate between trabecular and cortical bone. If you look at newer RCTs that are coming out on therapeutic agents, you will see studies that are looking at trabecular bone outcomes and cortical bone densities. There are differential parameters that can be measured. And this is particularly useful in randomized controlled studies to assess the therapeutic effects. Also in other conditions such as hyperparathyroidism and steroid induced osteoporosis and hypogonadism, uh, celiac disease, ankylosing spondylitis, other rheumatologic conditions, where these modalities are giving us additional information on the differential effects on various drugs on trabecular bone and cortical compartments. So um, moving on to the next slide. Um, again, the trabecular bone contributes 20% of skeletal mass and we get to know greater surface area and it contributes to greater surface area than the cortical bone and it provides supporting strength to the ends of weight bearing bones. And the cortical bone provides 80% of skeletal mass and it provides the solid outside shaft of long bones. 
Um, and this is essentially an osteoporotic bone in a postmenopausal uh, woman. And you can see how um, severely the microarchitecture and those bone roots and uh, pillars of the uh, micro trabecular bone is affected in an osteoporotic bone uh, with propensity to fracture. So coming to the indications of bone density, which is measured by DEXA, uh, we use it to diagnose osteoporosis. Obviously, the World Health Organization classification nomenclature of osteoporosis, osteopenia, are based on bone mineral density. You cannot uh, label anybody as having osteoporosis or osteopenia based on chest x-ray. You have to use standard classification based on a bone density assessment. And we sometimes use bone density to predict fracture risk. Uh, we'll come to that. For example, FRAX, and in Canada, we use the Canadian uh, Osteoporosis Canada guidelines using bone density and age to predict fractures. And bone density also has an important role in monitoring treatment. The role of the bone density, again, there is a strong relationship between bone and fracture risk, bone density and fracture risk. To come up with an analogy, it is even powerful than the association between commonly used uh, scenarios such as serum cholesterol and coronary artery disease, and also between hypertension and stroke. So it's a very strong predictor of fracture risk. Bone density, again, the un unfortunate part is that it only com captures one component of fracture risk, and you may uh, miss other risk factors if you just uh, give more emphasis on bone density alone. So we need to use other fracture risk assessment tools. That is the hard outcome that we are actually trying to measure. So these are the same devices which are used to uh, central, assess central DEXA. We use hip and spine assessments and also in certain scenarios, uh, forearm bone density to calculate central DEXA. And the, on the left side, you see the Hologic DEXA device. And on the right side is the Lunar Prodigy device, which is commonly available in India um, as well. And the peripheral DEXA, we use uh, heel and uh, uh, peripheral bones such as uh, tibia. So this is essentially the basic uh, um, science aspect of the DEXA technology. And uh, this technology offers very low radiation to patient and uh, also very less radiation exposure to technologists too. And it's again an X-ray based technology. The radiation exposure is less, uh, nearly one tenth of that of a regular chest X-ray. But with vertebral fractal analysis, you might uh, have a little extra radiation. But again, it is minimal. So this is a, a slide to highlight the positioning of the patient. So for the uh, uh, hip and And again, um, uh, for the uh, for uh, the patient. So coming to the hip, uh, and next slide, please. Yeah. So this is the DEXA image of the hip on the left side. That's the region of interest that is highlighted on the DEXA software. And on the right side, uh, we measure L1, L2, L3, L4. Ideally, you have to have measurements from all four vertebrae to generate a high quality bone uh, DEXA report. Minimum, we need to have at least two bone uh, vertebral bo bodies to have a good assessment of the vertebral strength. Sometimes I see reports with one uh, vertebral body being measured. Those uh, are not validated and those should be um, uh, discouraged. That sort of reporting of bone density should be discouraged. We need minimum two, but ideally all four vertebrae, uh, L1 to L4. And so aerial bone density is two-dimensional. This is calculated as gram per centimeter. We have the option of... Uh, getting three-dimensional volumetric bone density assess with advanced DEXA high-resolution PQCT uh, measurement. So that's gram per centimeter cube. So the T-score essentially compares the patient's bone density with that of a young normative database that you use. And it is comparing your bone, a postmenopausal woman's bone density to that of a young, uh, healthy adult who has achieved peak bone mass potentially. Now, uh, DEXA-based bone density, um, uh, also the DEXA software and the machine itself can be used to derive trabecular bone score. We can do uh, advanced techniques, as hip structural analysis, which is an important predictor of uh, hip fracture risk. And in children and sometimes in um, bariatrics and obesity management and in sports, uh, we use it for body composition analysis. And DEXA-based vertebral fracture assessment is also very popular. Uh, again, uh, some of these techniques are not fully validated as uh, DEXA, uh, DEXA-based BMD assessment. So that's a limitation. So this is a vertebral fracture assessment and using a lateral spine image, which is captured uh, with the same... assessment. And limitations, uh, quality assurance, and uh, there's a lot of technology assessment procedures uh, almost every day and weekly. And so there's a lot of um, backup uh, on that aspect. Uh, otherwise, we will end up with a poor quality report. Uh, 
um, from the software. Um, and there are also, as a clinician, uh, people with chronic back pain, these are not indications to order a bone density, kyphosis, and of course, right, not right after menopause, unless the patient has other clinical factors. We should be careful. Um, uh, on the indications of bone density. Of course, these uh, indications are now we'll going to the details of um, India with that. And that is medication, prior fracture, low body weight. And there are conditions where, you know, men, we, there is increasing awareness of osteoporosis in men and the indications of bone density measurement in men. Uh, so we are starting to capture more uh, cases in men as well. And, um, and also more importantly, anyone being considered for treatment before starting anti-resorptive treatment, you have to have a baseline bone density because we need to uh, assess serial bone density to assess the monitor, uh, response to treatment. So it's an important tool to monitor therapeutic response, um, uh, especially uh, in menopausal women. Which skeletal size should be measured? Uh, we are looking at spine. Uh, next slide, Ina. Yes. Yep, go on to the next slide, please. Yeah. yeah, with skeletal set, ideally we measure spine L1 to L4 and hip, we measure the total hip and femoral neck. Hip is the most, most important predictor of fracture. So uh, an assessment of hip bone density is a very, very integral part of your bone density assessment. And in some patients, in certain scenarios, for example, if the patient is uh, having significant hyperparathyroidism, they are obese, you cannot position them on the DEXA table, then you can use a forearm. And sometimes, you know, patients have had hip replacement, so that makes hip um, impossible to be measured or in patients with severe spondylitis, bamboo spine, spine or with significant degenerative changes, spine is not uh, an ideal site. So when both hip and spine are not available for measurement, you can use the uh, forearm bone density. But the problem with the, the fracture predictive algorithms and predictive uh, ability of forearm bone density is not as good or robust as a hip bone density. That is the main limitation. Okay, um, so we can move on to the next slide. Yeah, site selection, again, monitoring the lumbar spine has the advantage of reflecting the quickest therapeutic response, uh, but then it carries the potential of encountering artifact-induced uh, um, errors. So positioning for lumbar spine bone density, positioning the patient on the lumbar spine uh, bone density is extremely important. Sometimes if the patient has ter terrible back pain, it's very difficult to position them and to get, and it is, again, uh, very difficult to get a prop, a prop good bone density reading. So the spinous process should be in the midline and we should include part of the sacrum and also part of a vertebrae with ribs. So these uh, steps have to be very meticulously followed. With uh, rotation, we end up estimating uh, uh, low values. And again, vertebral rotation. So scoliosis, again, invalid. It is difficult to get a bone density in people with scoliosis because of the issues with positioning. And moving on to the next slide, again, scoliosis, we end up getting lower bone densities on the side of the convexity of the scoliotic bone. And in worst case, if you end up taking, you can try the proximal femur. Again, it should be measured on the femur on the side of the convexity. Artifacts, we are all familiar. They're very notorious. Uh, ask about history of surgical clips, barium. Uh, if the patient has had any procedure such as barium swallow or a CAT scan, a CT scan, it's better to wait for at least seven to 10 days before you order a bone density. Then we have these metal artifacts comes to us as a surprise. Uh, and osteophytes often um, complicate the picture. They lead to overestimation, falsely normal bone density. And they say that up to 9.5% uh, at L4 and 13.9% uh, overestimation at uh, uh, L1. And the another important contributor is facet sclerosis, significantly, again, increase the bone density or even a fractured bone give us a falsely normal bone density. And even people with ankylosing spondylitis, bamboo spain, you see that their bone density is normal or supranormal often. And osteoarthritis and other bony disorders can also cause, and, and that's a picture of the barium um, dye, um, again, causing error and erroneous measurements. So again, uh, on the right side, you see artifacts with the hip too. That's a hip prosthesis uh, causing uh, interference at the bone density measurement. Uh, this is uh, moving to the next slide, please. And this is the standard bone density uh, reading you see. We see the region of interest, L, and then on the hip, you see total proximal femur combining femoral neck shaft and for candor or femoral neck separately. And then the T score and the Z score comparing patients' BMD with that of adults of the same age and sex. And then vertebral fracture assessment, if available, can be utilized. 
So these are, again, problems with the positioning. You see how the spine is not aligned. Again, similar issues with the hip uh, as well, rotation and other artifacts, degenerative changes in the hip with osteoarthritis of the hip and also other, and this is again, um, uh, calcium, um, IOT calcification, other forms of dystrophic calcification causing falsely high bone density. Um, moving to the next slide, again, yeah, IOT calcification showing up uh, falsely normal bone density and interfering with the readings. Uh, fracture of the uh, L3 vertebrae, again, showing up as normal reading. So these are examples. And another sin other scenarios potentially causing increase in bone density. Uh, you can expect to see pancreatic calcification interfering, renal stones, gall stones, radio contrast, IOT calcification fractures. Again, that's a summary. And ankylosing spondylitis, I'm showing this slide because I've done some research in the area. Most of them have normal spine BMD. And many a times we're not able to use the hip because they have significant coccyxis and pain. They're difficult to be positioned on the uh, hip, uh, on the BMD table. Significant interference in the bone density there. Although these patients have high risk of fractures. Uh, going to the next slide, Vina. Yeah, you can skip. Mo go on. Yeah, that was the ankylosing spondylitis slide. Uh, the next one. So... Again, uh, we have um, uh, published some data uh, using HRPQCT uh, in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. We get a volumetric bone density. We are able to see the trabecular number, thickness separation, cortical thickness, porosity, and you, we, we can even use finite element analysis and measure bone stiffness and stress. These are important predictors of fractures in these patients. Okay, uh, the next slide. And again, as I mentioned, coming back to hip bone density, two dimensional, but we have to carefully position the patient on the table. Uh, ideally, the hip has to be internally rotated by 15 to 20%. Uh, that's the way they position the hip. The technician uh, is very well aware of these uh, positioning aspects. Uh, otherwise, the bone density will be increased. Uh, moving to the next slide. Um, again, effect of leg dominance, not a big deal. Uh, uh, unlike forearm, where it plays a big role, uh, right arm versus left arm. Uh, forearm, uh, again, in scenarios where, yep, next slide, uh, in people who are very obese or uh, have significant hyperparathyroidism and other scenarios, we use forearm bone density. Next slide, please. The common uh, uh, sites used are 33% of one third side. Again, these are all measured uh, as a distance from the ulnar bone and also the ultra distal site. Uh, again, this is the forearm bone density generated by the software. Uh, going on again, forearm, uh, it's um, the dominance has an effect, 33% uh, 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 bone density radial site also. So it is important to use a non-dominant site ideally. And again, prior fracture can also cause uh, artifactual effects, movement artifacts. Uh, moving on to the BMD definitions, I briefly said that bone density uh, measurement is the gold standard for defining osteoporosis and osteopenia. You should never label somebody as having osteopenia based on ultrasound or X-ray results. So very important to remember these definitions have been validated and uh, standardized. Uh, those are the definitions. On the next slide, uh, we are all familiar with T-scores, Z-score, and um, so I'm not going into that. This is based on WHO definitions. Uh, again, the software itself will generate these scores based on the, uh, it's all uh, uh, Pre, um, it's all pre-programmed to generate these scores based on the reference normative database used by the software provided by the manufacturer, and they're all very well validated. Uh, next slide, that's how the Z-score is mentioned. Z-score is uh, comparing uh, patients' bone density to that of age and sex compared uh, people. In India, too, we have population-based and ethnic-based uh, population uh, reference uh, normative database, uh, thanks to a lot of research studies done. Uh, but then uh, probably Indians have um, um, lower BMD because of frame size, height, size and changes in vertebral size, hip width, uh, geometric parameters, and nutritional factors, genetic factors. So we need a separate normative uh, reference database, which has been validated now again. Now, diagnostic caveats, a T-score negative less than 2.5 is not always osteoporosis. It could be osteomalacia. Always remember that. And clinical diagnosis is very important. Uh, it, uh, that's also, you know, you have to go through the clinical history. A traumatic, uh, a fragility fracture in a patient with a normal or osteopenic T-score is still considered an osteoporosis because you have to look at the clinical history as well. So, and the other uh, limitation is that a T-score doesn't usually give you the diagnosis. So medical evaluation uh, is important. Rule out other conditions for demineralization, osteomalacia, celiac disease, etc. And we know why do we use negative 2.5? It's an important slide in the osteoporosis world. We use this cutoff because this cutoff I approximately identified 30% of postmenopausal women as having osteoporosis using hypospine measurements or even forearms. So this is approximately equivalent to the lifetime risk, which has been published widely. 
And again, uh, and, and I'm going to skip the slide. We do know Z scores are important to patient, classify patients as having normal or low fracture risk. So there are all standard definitions. So I'm going to skip those slides. And again, T score can be discordant. We often see that you know patients might have uh, low normal T score, but abnormal at the spine, but abnormal T score at the hip. The T scores at the hip and spine can be um, discordant. You have to always verify when you see more than one standard deviation uh, difference in the T score the hip and the spine that you always look for uh, artifact and occult uh, those are the tips that we uh, when we go through individual bone density results look for those tips uh, why is it discordant is there any manufacturing error reporting error or other positioning error other other reasons metabolic factors or se selectively some diseases can affect the t-score at the spine more uh, than the hip for example steroid induced osteoporosis we see spine more affected than the hip right so those are and early menopause you see spine more affected so those are the important uh, discordant reasons and I'm going to skip. And then again, during follow-up, ideally, the patient has to go uh, at the same manufacturer, same machine. Uh, that's the way it is calibrated. Ideally, you cannot. It, it is possible to compare DEXA results from different machines, but often there are uh, uh, potential sources of error. So ideally, use the same machine, but they do use conversion algorithms too to interpret uh, DEXA readings from different machines. So in conclusion, we have to remind ourselves that fracture risk is multifactorial. It's not always DEXA. There are other factors, clinical factors, geometric factors, microarchitecture, etc. And correct interpretation of BMD is often based on anthropometric information that we feed into the software positioning, technical aspects, artifacts, and the type of reference database we use. And newer modalities such as HRP QCT are, um, are ideal, but we need validation studies in terms of fracture outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nisha. That was a very comprehensive coverage of the topic. Uh, uh, I think uh, we have a few questions lined up. Although there was an initial software glitch up, and well, I'm happy that uh, we were able to uh, bring out the best in you. Uh, uh, the one question that we have had is, uh, what is the role of peripheral DEXA, especially in, uh, what, what is the uh, role of peripheral DEXA, especially in patients with uh, inflammatory rheumatic diseases to plan prophylaxis or treatment? Again, these are used as uh, screening tools. Um, as an endocrinologist, when we look at the fracture outcome data, these are not well validated. So often we consider those as inferior, but in a low resource setting, if that's the only thing available, yes, you can go ahead and use it. Uh, there are studies that are looking at, you know, there are there. There, there is not a strong correlation between peripheral de dexa and spine fracture or hip fracture. That these are weak correlations. But of course, if that's the only thing available, yes, you can use them as. Is is there any other way of estimating? Is the ultrasound the only way for estimating? Uh, sorry, no, can... there are peripheral dexa based peripheral screen. Uh, uh, there are smaller machines that can be used, portable machines to what? assess uh, peripheral dexa. Uh, how and those are getting advanced too. Yeah, heel based, and also there are DEXA based peripheral uh, uh, DEXA um, uh, machines too, smaller ones. How useful is the uh, how use, useful is the ultrasound uh, uh, for peripheral DEXA estimation? Yeah, again, the same issue, right? The heel uh, problems, uh, the same, uh, the predictive algorithms and predictive outcomes may not be that strong. That's all. Okay, we have another question. Uh, how does this influence the DEXA scan results? This again is very similar to bamboo spine, right? You see hyperostosis. So in, in such conditions, it's better to use uh, hip bone density or forearm bone density. Okay. And does decrease in fracture risk always correlate with improvement in BMD when the patient is on bisphosphonate? That is another question Subdamin has asked. Yeah, not really, actually, because we also look at the bone uh, turnover marker. Sometimes the bone density improves. We may not, we, the patient might still uh, have a fracture, right? So it's, it's often multifactorial, even when we are monitoring these patients. So it is not always 100% uh, correlative of, uh, uh, of um, decreased fracture risk. Again, sometimes it might be because we often do not stop the medication when the bone density is stable, or sometimes it's declining, uh, provided the patient cannot afford another agent. Sometimes we continue because the, uh, the bisphosphonates can often improve bone quality, not just bone density. Bone microarchitecture can improve to some extent, so it's not an absolute correlation there. Okay. I think uh, that's all we have time for now. It was a very lucid and uh, comprehensive discussion. Um, and say hi to Nigel from us. No, <laughs> sure. Thank you. Nice meeting everybody. Okay, thank you. We'll wind up this talk and uh, now we have a short panel discussion. Uh, can we have all the panelists to join in?
so i think uh, uh, we have got a lot of questions which have come up so uh, since uh, we did we were having some shortage of time in discussion in between the talks we decided to take up this questions in the end uh, so uh, uh, we have included this in the panel discussion so the first talk, first question uh, that i would like to put to dr danda sir uh, sir dr p sumang he has asked who is treating pages disease is it the endocrinologist or rheumatologist can you share your experience Uh, sorry, uh, your voice got broken. I couldn't hear. Uh, so the question yeah. is, who is who treats pages disease? Is it an endocrinologist or a rheumatologist? I, I see. Well, that's a good question. Uh, there are not many pages which are diagnosed thankfully. If that was there, that, that was the case, then that question may arise. <laughs> But uh, yes, we have, we do see a few patients of pages. Although the literature describes that it's after some age, it's not that uncommon. Probably most of them go. unnoticed uh, well i have no problem whoever wants to treat <laughs> there is no such thing but we have uh, uh, we have had very few patients uh, so i cannot claim a great experience uh, of treating patients uh, pages with uh, in our specialty yeah uh, rheumatologists uh, treat i have seen abroad also it is the rheumatologists who mostly treat pages but uh, it's a, it's a metabolic bone disorder again so probably it's good to have the endocrinologist in the loop uh dr praveen uh you had uh, discussed about uh, dena uh, you had discussed actually about therapeutic matthew is not with us so maybe you can shed light into this question how do you manage a missed dose of denosumab how do you proceed all right so uh, i think uh, missed dose it depends on how long it has been missed so obviously this six month three dose so when you do, uh, miss a dose then the uh, resorption starts picking up very fast so uh, this is a question which has been raised in uh, many of the guidelines also so there is no clear answer but then within few months if you don't use it then the markers will go overboard and then the fracture will, will increase so it's like just like you know you go off the beaten track you miss it and then you don't want to find a clear answer then you can miss till this day you can miss so that sort of answer will never come out i think so yeah. you have to use it as fast as possible and if you uh, the miss is for few months then you are in big trouble what uh, I, i think this question can dr ramesh can address this question what is the opinion on using teriparated after a total hip replacement or a total knee replacement uh, there is no recommendation so far but uh, it is uh, in some papers it have shown that it improves the periprosthetic uh, bone mineral density so you can use it definitely because uh, you know after the hip replacement and knee replacement there is a definite risk of fall so a fall will uh, to good extent as i said i told that for point percentage of 4.1 percentage of all uh, falls will lead to fracture so to prevent this uh, falls and falls related fracture you can definitely use teriparatide but it it improves the periprosthetic bmd also but it's, it doesn't come into the recommendations so far uh and this question is to dr veena uh how uh, uh, how do you manage a case of uh, pediatric uh, osteoporosis do we need to give uh, um, bisphosphonate to a patient on prophylactic prophylactic bisphosphonate to a patient on steroids so we we initially manage with the uh, um, as i said uh, nutritional that is pro pro providing appropriate protein rich diet and calcium and mineral supplementation and if there is a vertebral fracture there is a, if we we do bmd and there is a, a severe osteoporosis by z score my, my less than minus 2.5 and you have a what sign clinically significant fracture that is a vertebral fracture or more than two long bone fractures then we will definitely give uh, bisphosphonates uh Yes, thank you, Vina. Uh, this patient, is, uh, this question is to Dr. Venkatesh. Uh, is there any indication for giving prophylactic uh, bisphosphonates or uh, uh, or bone anabolics in patients receiving um, um, drugs which lead to osteoporosis other than steroids? Are there any standard recommendations for prophylactic treatment? Uh, I don't think there are recommendations as such. Uh, maybe for glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, uh, if there are risk factors as we had discussed yesterday uh depending on the risk you may uh, start the patient on 
uh, to put on uh, bisphosphonates. Otherwise, uh, there are no other recommendations for the other drugs. I think uh, this is a question that I have. Uh, I think uh, with Dr. Binoy sir's experience, he'll be able to uh, guide us. Uh, sir, uh, how easy is it to uh, convince the patient to go for a screening uh, uh, before for diagnosing osteoporosis? Because often the patient presents without any symptoms and we need to really diagnose it before actually developing a fracture. So how do you go about it, sir? I think uh, Binoy sir is not online. Dennis sir, can you take that question, sir? What is that, uh, Vishal? Uh, uh, it's a little break in the voice is coming. Okay, tell me again. Yes, sir. Uh, osteoporosis is a disease where actually you want to uh, give something to prevent it uh, even from happening. So it's often difficult to convince the patient to undergo a screening. So how would you go about uh, talking to the patient and convincing them to undergo a screening uh, uh, when the patient comes to the OPD? I think it's a very relevant question because uh, people do not generally worry about things that has not happened and osteoporosis is such a condition where there's no symptom unless you have a fracture so it's a painless silent epidemic so it's very uh, relevant to convince patients the importance of uh, preventing fracture then the bone density uh, is important to be assessed in, uh, in especially in the background illnesses where there is a high risk uh, postmenopausal inflammatory arthropathy glucocorticoid users so i think uh, we, sh we should be able to uh, explain the patients uh, the, the need for for undergoing the bmd uh, which is very relevant and it's a non invasive uh, process so i think uh, uh, we, there is no difficulty in convincing a patient to to educate and undergo uh, the screening there's one more question. I think, uh, sir, you can answer this, sir. Uh, is there any role for bisphosphonates or for uh, teriparatide in managing disease in rheumatoid arthritis other than osteoporosis? Very uh, interesting question. Actually, yesterday, uh, uh, I mean, I myself identify myself osteoporosis only up to a limit when the osteoporosis happens in the inflammatory arthropathy setting uh, or inflammatory autoimmune rheumatic disease setting. And out of all this, the most common thing which we come across uh, is uh, patients of RA and angspawn and also to some extent in lupus and other connective tissue diseases much before steroids are used. Uh, it, it just comes with that because of disease activity. So uh, in angspawn and RA, what is very important is apart from uh, giving them these drugs uh, to prevent uh, osteoporosis related fracture, uh, I just looked up and interestingly I found that the bisphosphonates also have an important anti-inflammatory role which was very interesting to find and uh, same is about vitamin D and others. About teriparatide, uh, uh, there are some animal experiment studies which I have, I have gone through and denosumab also has a controversial role, it's not well established, uh, there are reports in either way. So the role, of, basically as I was saying yesterday, the bone cells and the immune cells uh, cross-talking uh, is very important to understand that uh, inflammation has some role on osteoporosis uh, on, on the bone cells and the bone cells have some effect on you know pro, uh, the immune cells so so they they, they are physiology uh, they are uh, by by uh, by virtue of their mechanisms of action uh, there is a possibility that they can have but in real life uh, Bone, uh, bisphosphonates have one of the strongest roles uh, to have anti-inflammatory uh, property. I would just like to, if I'm, if I'm allowed to deviate for one minute to an important topic which you all have discussed in the preceding session and now, is uh, is about uh, one clinical situation uh, is uh, where the rheumatologists are asked uh, by orthopedicians to assess a patient when goes for a joint replacement and was uh, Dr. Ramesh was mentioning uh, is one of the uh, 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 scenarios where uh, we have found that um, uh, about 15 years back when we used to, we used to see that uh, sometimes the orthopedics uh, outcome of the joint replacement were a few cases where it was not very um, favorable then I 
we looked at the uh, the uh, the scenario of osteoporosis and i thought it may be a good idea to go for a major uh, surgery like joint replacement uh, only uh, after the bone density is a uh, acceptable range uh, they used to operate earlier blindly and then we found that it's not only the risk of fracture after weight bearing while they when they mobilize but also intra op the risks of uh, uh, bone damage is uh, fracture is high so in that respect i would like to say that bisphosphonate going to take ages to get a very minimum improvement in the bone density but what was very dramatic i, I do not know whether it real life translates to fracture reduction i think doctor Matthew and uh, Dr. Praveen can say uh, uh, is uh, that teriparatide was the most dramatic of all. Of, uh, we have used more than 200 plus patients. Uh, I, I myself have used more than 200 plus patients of RA and Angspawn uh, on teriparatide because of very bad osteoporosis. And people, when they uh, ask for orthopedics for surgery, we always ask the patient to improve the bone. Suppose the T score is minus three, four, five, in that range, even minus six. Uh, we have asked them to to go for teriparatide and in six months time the bone density improvement is remarkable it's a several fold higher than bisphosphonate which happens in bisphosphonate in years and we used to just arbitrarily we took a decision that we'll ask the patient to take at least six months of teriparatide while continuing the teriparatide at least six months of teriparatide review the bone density and then uh, decide for surgery at least the bone density improves a bit to prevent fracture so this is something i would like to share we have the data we have not analyzed it we have not published it but i'm just sharing with you my experience uh, i may be wrong but we have done that thank you, thank you sir uh, um, uh, dr Praveen, sir, there is one question for you uh, what is the uh, is there any comparison regarding the use of generic and uh, the generic and uh, the biosimilar recombinant uh, pth yeah, I wish I knew the answer to this question. In fact, I would have raised this question myself. But unfortunately, we live in India. So yeah, my guess is as good as yours. So, <laughs> but uh, it's gratifying to know that what Sir mentioned, the, the, the very generous increase in BMD has been seen with uh, both agents. So we are not really unhappy because we see what is expected almost like so they're not so bad but then head-to-head -head comparison uh, my guess is as good as yours probably the economics work out in favor exactly so that is a thing <laughs> uh, one more question to you after three consecutive years of zolendronic acid infusion right. uh, after a drug holiday can it be restarted yes it can be restarted there are very clear guidelines you're supposed to do a so the effect is supposed to last for at least three years in between deterioration is very unlikely but then again as Matthew clearly mentioned you're supposed to do periodic reevaluation at least at two yearly intervals and then once either the bmd starts falling or some people even look at bone turnover marker start rising then you can even restart it so there is actually 10 year safety data with use of all these agents so that's very gratifying uh, to Dr. Amesh, uh, how many months before conception should uh, bisphosphonates be stopped? Is there any recommendation regarding that? There is no recommendation regarding uh, you know stopping bisphosphonates so far. But uh, so far, the studies which have, especially the patients who are having inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatological conditions who are on bisphosphonates, they later conceive, and the data was digged upon, and it was found that there was no such adverse effects so far reported in the fetus. But you know, uh, subsequent follow-up studies in the uh, offsprings has not been taken care of uh, that well. So uh, we say that uh, one, one year for a planned conception, definitely one year prior to the conception, you can uh, plan to stop uh, this post uh, To Dr. Venkatesh, how often uh, do we need to do a BMD in a patient on uh, corticosteroids or with rheumatic disease? Is there any recommendation when to do a BMD and how often to do a BMD? Okay. So, uh, as I had shown yesterday in the uh, discussion, at the initial uh, six months, that's a time when there's a rapid uh, decrease in the bone, bone mineral density. And it's recommended that if the patients are taking for uh, glucocorticoids for more than three months, so we need to do a baseline BMT and then repeat it after one year to see what is the loss. Uh, and then we can uh, decide whether treatment is required or not. 
Thank you. Uh, to Dr. Veena, uh, in osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, bisphosphonates are used for treatment. Any similar date on teriparate? No, teriparate is not recommended to use below 18 years of age. So we usually don't use it. I think uh, we have answered most of the queries that have been raised from the uh, attendees. Uh, if there are a few of them which have left behind, I think we are running short of time. We have had, uh, I believe that we have had two days of excellent discussion, fruitful talks. I thank all the uh, panelists, uh, speakers, chairperson from the bottom of my heart for uh, uh, living up to our expectations. Uh, I, I also thank all the delegates who have attended. Uh, thank you for sparing your valuable time. And I believe, I hope that you have all taken a, uh, at least a few messages from these two days. Uh, thank you. We will be back with another similar uh, program in a couple of months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you, Dr. Vina. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank thank you, you for joining us. A couple of minutes. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone thank in your team, Vishal. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Pravin, sir. Thank you, Ramesh. And bye, Venkatesh Vina. <laughs> we'll see you again. Bye, Venkatesh. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>